So let's say that you're in a really long, awful meeting, and the guy at the front of the room has been talking forever. You're really bored, and you're starting to zone out, and you can hear that he's still talking, but you're not really retaining any of the information. Your neighbor notices that your head has started to bob a little bit, and she nudges you, and all of a sudden you go from this very quiet state to being fully awake and aware and focus on your surroundings, and you really start processing the information that the speaker is presenting. We're specifically interested in how these behavioral state transitions occur. We'd like to know how cortical circuits can move from one mode of processing to another, and what that means for the way the brain deals with incoming information from the environment. What we mean by behavior state? Two examples of behavior states are movement versus sitting quietly. Now, these two states are significantly different in at least two main aspects, at the level of motor activity and at the arousal level. In our study, we are going to use a mouse model to address the separate effects of arousal and motor activity by looking at the brain activity of mice as they transition between behavior states. To measure arousal, we made movies of the mouse's eye and extracted pupil diameter. To measure movement, we tracked the position of a mouse on a wheel. In our first experiment, we wanted to track the brain activity as the animal natural transitions from behavior state to behavior state. In order to measure brain activity, we are going to apply two metrics. First, we are going to measure the firing of individual neurons, and second, we are going to measure the local field potential, which roughly corresponds to the sun synaptic activity of the local network. When the mouse is not moving, you see large amplitude slow fluctuations in the local field potential. Also, the pupil is constricted. When the mouse starts moving, cells become more active and the pupil is dilated. You also see that the local field potential gets flat. Now, something very interesting happens when the mouse just stops moving. First of all, you see that the pupil is still dilated, which means that the mouse is still aroused, even though it's not moving. Second of all, you see that the local field potential is flat. On the other hand, you see that the firing of the cells is completely suppressed. So, what do behavior states of movement and arousal means in terms of the patterns of brain activity? We saw that the waves in the local field potential are very well correlated with pupil diameter, but not at all with running speed. We also saw that the firing rates of cells during locomotion are very high, but when the animal stops moving, are highly suppressed. We thus conclude that during locomotion, there's an increase in the neuronal activity, and totally contrary to what we were expecting during arousal, there's a high suppression of neuronal activity. Renata just told you what happens in the brain with spontaneous transitions in behavioral state. We wanted to go one step further and induce a causal change in behavioral state. The idea was to make the animal become aroused in the absence of movement. To that end, we presented air puffs on the back of the mouse. Here you see an example. The pupil is small and the local field potential shows large amplitude slow fluctuations. Now we apply an air puff. See that the pupil dilates and that the local field potential desynchronizes. At the same time, the cell's firing rates become suppressed. Up to this point, we have only considered the effects of arousal and spontaneous brain activity. With spontaneous brain activity, we mean activity in the absence of visual stimulation. You could say that this is the brain's noise. Our next question was how arousal affects visual processing. To study that, we performed the same experiments, but now the mouse is viewing drifting gratings. This activates the cells in the primary visual cortex. You could say that this is the brain's signal. Remember that spontaneous brain activity got suppressed by arousal. Interestingly, we find that visually evoked activity does not get suppressed by arousal. We conclude that the signal-to-nose ratio of visual responses increases. In other words, with arousal, the brain gets more exclusively driven by external inputs. This is like turning down the ambient light in a room so it gets more easy to see the content on the projector screen. This series of experiments allowed us to tease apart the contributions of arousal and locomotion to the changes that happen in the brain during a behavioral state transition. We found that the major effect of arousal was actually to suppress background noise in the brain that might make it harder for the brain to encode information about the surrounding sensory environment. One of the reasons we're so interested in these mechanisms of flexible brain function is that they're compromised in several human disorders, including autism and schizophrenia. In the long run, we'd really like to understand not only how the brain functions 
functions flexibly during healthy states, but also how these mechanisms are disrupted during disease.